you know, even in the very aggressive scenarios, you're still going to be using a fair amount of oil and natural gas in 2050. But to try and really change the fundaments of what is today an $86 trillion world economy, $187 trillion roughly in 2050, and just in 28 years that we're going to go from this to that, I think um, is to put it, you know, optimistic, unrealistic. There are going to be a lot of bumps along the roads, and I think we're seeing a big bump right now. Welcome to Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast featuring the icons and entrepreneurs of technology, commodities and finance, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we examine the questions, are we facing a crisis of information or a crisis of trust? And will building smarter markets be the antidote? Hello, Dan. Thank you very much for joining us on our podcast today. I'm uh, honored that you're going to share your energy expertise with us because there's so much going on in energy markets that I really want to pick your brain a little bit and find out from you, you know, what the most important energy issues are of the day. You know, we're seeing really interesting energy markets now. We're seeing uh, basically an energy crisis in China, in Europe. We're seeing higher prices in the United States, but uh, not what people expected and raising a lot of questions about the future of energy and about the future of investment and about what will be available for people and economies in the years ahead. So let me ask you just a, a couple of things so you can help us really understand what, what is going on. So you mentioned China and Asia. So certainly China and Asia are very much in the news today facing high energy costs, shortages of coal, natural gas. I just read last night that China is now restricting diesel. What do you think is driving these high prices in Asia? And then also I want to ask you a little bit about Europe, which is facing really the same crisis. I think in Asia and really in China, what it is, a lot of this is actually comes out of COVID, which is China went into overdrive as the world's workshop and uh, its demand for energy went up. It became, you know, providing more and more stuff to the United States and to North America. And uh, it ran up to underinvestment in coal and uh, constraints in natural gas. So those two came together. That's radiated into Europe now because LNG that was going to go to Europe got diverted to China and prices have been five or six times or seven times normal. And on top of that, in Europe, England and other of the countries have become much more dependent upon offshore wind. And you know what? The wind didn't blow for several weeks. So everything came together. And there's Britain saying, we're going to go off coal. And what have they done? They had to start up an old coal-fired power plant and use coal because uh, the markets are so tight. Factories are shutting down. As you say, rationing electricity in China. You know, it's an energy crisis, but it's also a different kind of energy crisis than we've had before. Okay, so what are, well, you mentioned a couple of things I want to go into. One, you know, you mentioned the perfect storm. And as soon as you said perfect storm, I immediately think weather, right? I mean, what, what's the number one driver of, especially natural gas prices, tends to be weather. Cold winter causes prices to rise, right? As people fill storage. How do you see the weather impacting natural gas prices for the world going forward? And, you know, maybe you could touch on to the, the importance of storage. And does Asia have storage? Does Europe have storage? How does storage factor in? In terms of storage, the simple answer is not enough. Not enough storage for natural gas in China. Not enough in Western Europe. They've, the Western Europeans have been almost sort of dismissive of natural gas, talking, well, do we want to include natural gas in our mix? And then suddenly it discovers that you really need natural gas and you need storage the wind blows, that's intermittent, and it, it's much more dependent upon weather and clouds and so forth. And, and so that's been a big issue. And then, you know, as we head into the winter, the question that's overhanging every energy decision maker, serious decision maker I talk of, with across the world is, uh, are we going to have a cold winter or not? If we don't have a cold winter, you know, we'll slide through this. If we're going to have a cold winter, we'll have more disruptions. What's your view on that? Uh, are we going to have a cold winter globally? What's the what's the outlook? Just check how often the weather forecast at the beginning of the week is borne out by the end of the week. So, I mean, obviously people do predictions for climate for 30 or 50 years from now, but 
predicting the weather a week ahead is, you know, pretty difficult. I mean, you know, people say, well, we expect the wet winter to be somewhat colder than in the past, but um, than other winters. Last winter was cold, and that's one reason natural gas storage is not as high as it normally would be. So weather is one of those variables that you you can't control for. All you can try and do is be prepared and be resilient. Judging by uh, what we're seeing in energy markets, it, it certainly sounds like most countries are 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 not resilient, <laughs> which I guess you know leads me maybe a little bit to something you alluded to, you know, the energy transition. And you said Europe's struggling with having enough renewables when the wind doesn't blow. So maybe you could walk us through, you know, the energy transition. What's what's the vision? How does it play out for various countries? Well, let me put in two, two things. I think what's happened with this kind of crisis, and we're certainly seeing higher prices in the U.S., and we're seeing oil prices pulled up beyond the range generally expected. I think it's going to force a rethink about assumptions about the speed at which you move ahead on your net zero, and in particular about the adequacy or inadequacy of energy investment to deal with the next 10 or 20 years. I think you know people have just thought, oh, it's a easy move to go from here to there very quickly. And to put this in context, in the new map, I go out on a limb, but a limb that I feel comfortable saying that we have, are in this 312th year of the energy transition. It began in January of 1709 when an English metal worker figured out you could make better iron using coal rather than wood. And so we had these energy transitions, but they've really been energy additions. First of all, they take a century to unfold or longer. Secondly, they, as I say in the new map, it's really energy addition. You know, oil overtook coal as the world's number one energy source in the 1960s. But we use a lot more coal today than we did in the 1960s. And so the question here is trying to jam energy transition into 28 years, not energy addition, but energy flip-flop. We're going to go from A to B. And um, you know, even in the very aggressive scenarios, you're still going to be using a fair amount of oil and natural gas in 2050. But to try and really change the fundaments of what is today an $86 trillion world economy, $187 trillion roughly in 2050, and just in 28 years that we're going to go from this to that, I think um, is, to put it, you know, optimistic, unrealistic. There are going to be a lot of bumps along the roads, and I think we're seeing a big bump right now. Okay. And so you said you think these high prices will will force it a rethink. And I'm very glad you mentioned your most recent book, The New Map, which is excellent. And in your book, you start with the United States. And so when you know, when I think energy transition, what comes to mind first and foremost to me is the role of the United States and in particular the role of US shale gas and US LNG exports. And um, that, you know, that's chapter one of your book. <laughs> so maybe you could, you could walk us through that. Exactly. What I tried to do in the new map is basically say, what's really changed in the last half decade? And there were three things. U.S. shale, the split between the United States and China, and then, of course, energy transition, climate agenda. Within that, there are a lot of other things, but those have re really changed the terrain. So what the new map tries to do is, is lay out and provide an understanding of this new terrain. And part of the new terrain is what you say, U.S. shale, which came from nowhere, wasn't expected, and yet has had a profound impact. Eight U.S. presidents said, we've got to be energy independent. And it seemed like a joke. We'd never get there. Lo and behold, we went from importing 60% of our oil a dozen years ago in the United States to today being virtually, you know, give or take, basically energy independent and the world's largest producer of oil and natural gas. This is a really big change in energy supply, in terms of energy security, in terms of the economy of the United States, and in terms of the United States position in the world in ways that are really not well understood or recognized. Just taken for granted. And so in terms of the energy transition, it sounds like the energy transition is, is going to take a... <laughs> we're, we're still in, in the transition phase, it seems to me, which to me means there's still a, a very big role for natural gas and, and LNG to play. And I'm wondering if you, if you agree with that and what that means. 
Yes, I absolutely. So we've just done a very, really aggressive, the most aggressive scenario we could imagine with really aggressive government policies. And in that very aggressive scenario, oil demand continues to increase, you know, into this decade. And it's still 55, 56 million barrels a day in 2050, less than today. That's the very aggressive scenario. Natural gas continues to grow for longer, but it's a much larger mix and renewables are a bigger part of it. You know, and, and certainly now hydrogen is part of the discussion and is on the agenda for people. But we're starting from zero with hydrogen because that industry as an energy source, hydrogen exists as a business, but not as an energy source. So I think what we still have in 2050 is an energy mix. It's a different mix and a different balance within it, but these other energy resources are still an important part of it. And that's in the very aggressive scenario. We, we, call, it, we call it, by the way, the green rules scenario. Green, both in terms of uh, green ruling and the rules, in, you know, like regulations. Is this uh, something I assume IHS has done? And is this something that'll be rolled out and, and is public? Yes, it is public. We're, we are sharing it and it's, you know, it's, it's eye-opening and we've done it as a narrative. It's a very, you know, dramatic story, but, you know, there's also what we call inflections in which you don't get much decline in oil and natural gas. And people for, think that, um, that oil is just what they put in their gas tanks, but of course, 20% of an electric car is plastics. Right, right. It's all, it's, it's all interconnected. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot of what's used in a hospital you know, the equipment to put stents into somebody's heart, those are plastic tools. Right. It's, um, and, and there are images out there uh, where you can, you know, what, where does a barrel of oil go? And a lot goes to plastics and, and so forth. It's not just what you put in your car. Yeah. And one of the things I point out in the new map, because there's obviously recycling of plastic is going to become much more important, but 1% of the plastic in the ocean comes from the United States. 80% comes from 10 rivers in Africa and Asia. If those rivers were managed, you know, it would vastly reduce the plastic waste in the ocean. There's so many issues that, that the world is tackling, right? Uh, the energy transition, which is in part uh, been dwarfed by net zero targets. Do you see the energy transition and net zero targets? Uh, what do you think is the interplay between those two? Well, I think everybody, almost it seems, countries around the world, companies, financial institutions are adopting net zero carbon. I think the reality is that the direction is clear, the what is clear, the how is not at all clear. A lot depends upon even the IEA, even John Kerry said, half the technologies you need haven't been invented yet. So uh, there's a lot of assumptions that go into that, but the direction is clear. But I think what's also clear is there's a split between the developed and the developing nations, because the developing nations Climate is an imperative, but so is reducing poverty and economic growth. The Netherlands is a lot richer country than India or Nigeria or you know, other developing countries. And so there are different perspectives on this and how to achieve it and, and who pays for it, by the way. So in other words, the, the path to decarbonization is, is going to play out differently depending on where you are in, in the world. I think, I think that's right. So maybe you could walk us through a few of the paths. And in your book, The New Map, you, you really focus a lot on some key countries. And so maybe you could tell us what, what is the path to decarbonization in the U.S., in Europe, in, you know, in Asia? Well, it really depends. Uh, you know, Europe has the most aggressive, and Europe wants to use its carbon border adjustment mechanisms, otherwise known as a carbon tariff, to impose its values and its systems on other countries. And uh, that's you know, a big subject of discussion, COP and elsewhere. I think it's going to be very controversial. And by the way, it's going to be a field day for lawyers because there's going to be so much legal contention over how do you measure these things? This isn't, you know, what are you measuring? And how accurate are the measurements? And we see you know, competing estimates of emissions and stuff like that carbon intensity. So it's going to be a huge regulatory industry, it re kind of reminding one, if you go back in history to the 1970s, oil price regulation was a bonanza for lawyers. And this will be a bonanza, I think, for lawyers, economists, NGOs, and others. So I think they're at the most extreme. India, I've, I'm on the energy think tank for, uh, for India, 
And I have a section in the book about India, and they talk about energy transitions. It's a plural, because for them, it's not only towards renewables and solar and their big goals, they're building a $60 billion natural gas pipeline system to get natural gas to people. They want to get propane to the villagers so they're not burning wood and waste and, and you know dying at the age of 34 from indoor air pollution. So they have different imperatives. So I think for the developing world, it's energy transition is a plural word, not a singular word. And I've heard that you know from senior energy decision makers. I'm glad you mentioned India because India is now, I think, the world's third largest energy consumer. And I know IHS Market just held uh, Sarah Week India. So were there any takeaways from that event that you can share with us? And the one that you mentioned was, you know, the role of natural gas and to alleviate pollution, which is still a very big issue in much of the developing world. Yeah. And I think at least a few years ago, and I think I mentioned in the new map, seven of the 10 most polluted cities in the world were in India. So cleaning up urban air, really important for them. They're very interested in, you know, compressed natural gas for car engines. The takeaway is that they do have a commitment to hydrogen. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has called it a national mission for hydrogen. So they want to use their industrial sector and see if they can bring down the cost of hydrogen and make it competitive. You know, I think biofuels looms large for them because they have such a large agricultural sector. And do they have different paths to biofuels than the classic, uh, you know, what we're doing uh, in the West where we're collecting chicken grease and uh, grease from restaurants and turn it into uh, biodiesel? I mean, they're looking at what can you do with the agricultural waste they have? And do, do they have a different way to go about it that makes sense for their situation? And they have a lot of technology and a lot of, I mean, I'm really impressed by the research capacity they have to address these issues. You've mentioned technology a a couple of times. And um, I mentioned to you when we were chatting before the podcast that I've been to your annual Sierra Week event uh, many times in in Houston. And um, it's a fabulous event. And every time I go, what strikes me is it's almost just as much about technology as it is energy. Right, you have an oil, gas. Uh, in the past, you've had a coal day, but much of the event is really focused on technology. And yes, Susan, thank you for observing that because it really has evolved. We established this part of the Sierra Week we call the Agora, which is all about technology and innovation. And you you go there; it's it just fills you with excitement, and you feel the human energy around this. And uh, that you know, every year it's been greater and greater. And I think this coming year. It will even be more powerful, the sense of, you know, of startups. We, we look for, for innovative, small innovative companies that are providing solutions, give them a platform. And we find that the, the established energy companies have a much more emphasis on innovation across the spectrum than in the past. They've sort of, you know, it's almost like venture capital. That, well, they are. They become active in venture capital in that regard. At the end of the day, the answer to all these questions is, you know, science and engineering, not regulation. And if, if anything, I'm a, you know, and I think that comes through in the new map, I'm, a, I'm an optimist because I'm a technology optimist. Well, historically, there's always been a new technology that sort of propels us forward, right? U.S. shale gas was technology and propelled us forward. So what kinds of breakthroughs do you think there will be in technology? Yeah, I I mean, it is interesting, too, how things are driven by individuals. Shale gas was driven by one man named George Mitchell. The electric car was driven by one man whose name is rather well known, Elon Musk. And I, I have a section in the book called Roadmap to the Future in the new map that in 2003, Elon Musk has lunch with this guy named J.B. Straubel, who is a Stanford graduate who has this idea that, well, what about electric airplanes? And Musk says, I'm not interested in that. Well, what about using lithium ion batteries for cars? Oh, I might be interested in that. That's 2003. A couple of years ago, Musk said, if we hadn't had that lunch, we might never have had a Tesla. And look at now, you know, the automobile makers are making pledges of being all electric by 2035 or 2030, which is not very far away. And there are questions that we can come to about supply chains. But this is a big deal. Everybody thought, you know, who thought about it at all, thought the electric car had died with Thomas Edison. He had made a big investment in it and it had failed because Henry Ford came along with the Model T. And But now we're looking at 
and I describe what I, a vision of auto tech, which is electric cars, ride hailing, and autonomous vehicles. And I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it is a different vision of the kind of transportation we'll use in the future uh, than, than we've all grown up with. I mentioned I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and um, lo and behold, you know, Tesla just hit a trillion dollar <laughs> market cap, and Ford is making an electric uh, F-150. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the iconic pickup truck in America is going electric. And, uh, you know, so I think they're all committed to it. I think there are questions about the new supply chains, as I call it, for net uh, zero carbon, and that maybe we're going to move, the way I put it in the new map, move from big oil to big shovels, because it's going to involve a lot of mining around the world. And that raises new issues about geopolitics and about social issues. Right. Well, um, you know, picking up on that, uh, you know, I, I would suspect that could change, further change the energy map as some of the resource-rich countries that haven't really participated very much in the global economy might now get their moment. I mean, is that your thought in terms of uh, mining for minerals? Well, I think so. But, you know, the Democratic Republic, the Congo, has, by the estimate of the IA, I think a million children who spend their time digging in mines, you know, child labor. And that cobalt is quite important, you know, for where we're headed with uh, electric cars and uh, or copper, you know. But what it really does, it ties together back to the China section of the book, you know, which I think from a geopolitical question is the most important question, obviously, for the 21st century, which is the relationship between the United States and China. And China has carved out a very distinctive position in, let's call it the new supply chains for net zero carbon, 80% of solar panels, 80% of the lithium ion battery supply chain, you know, investment is going on. I was on Capitol Hill today, where they're talking about $52 billion bill to support the semiconductor industry in the United States. But you can go down the list and you can see China dominating position in, in processing copper. So I think, you know, the traditional geopolitics involved oil in the Middle East, primarily natural gas to in certain instances. I think the new geopolitics of energy will be involved with this, um, these new supply chains and and I think that hasn't been factored in. And if you look at the demand increase, 4,300% for lithium, 2,500% for other minerals, you can't open a new mine in the United States. You know, you're going to have these new supply chains and they will bring new complexity. You know, of course, supply chain issues is sort of one of the number one issues in the world. Most consumers don't think of it in terms of lithium. They're thinking in terms of, you know, everyday consumer products. And you wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post in October saying you thought that the supply chain crunch will continue into 2022. So I was hoping maybe you could share some insights into that. We monitor this and analyze it. We're an original data source. We be an IHS market on it. We have, you know, port data. I mean, we can tell you that it takes three times as long to unload a, a container in Long Beach Harbor as it does in the Chinese container port. So it's very detailed information. And you have these large number of ships anchored. And the whole supply chain in the U.S. is kind of just snarled and jammed up. I was uh, doing an interview uh, at CBS, and uh, the producer beforehand said that she had ordered a bed in January, and it wasn't going to arrive, and it didn't arrive until September. You know, you can see the delays, but this has really hit manufacturers, and it's a whole system. What happened is because of COVID, people were not going out to have dinner or traveling. They were so they were at home and they were spending money on things which they were buying and which were being delivered to their house. So you had like five to six years of growth in e-commerce compressed into one year, and so much of it was uh, all going to you know to people's houses, and the system just wasn't designed for that. And then you had people not working because of COVID. You didn't have enough people in warehouses and so forth. And the whole system has just gotten backed up. And, you know, President Biden in October said, we're going to have a 90 day sprint to fix it. But it looks to us like it's going to be a marathon to fix it. And that's one of the factors that's feeding into inflation. 
So we really have two disruptions going on in the global economy. One is around supply chains, you know, and you have a COVID shutdown in China, it affects the whole system and it's shut in a Chinese port. And then you have this energy crisis uh, in the Eastern hemisphere. These are two things going on at the same time. And uh, with that seems to be the return of inflation, which is a big problem. And in the United States, you know, higher price gasoline prices at the pump, which is always a problem for political incumbents, at least in the United States. And lo and behold, the Biden administration, of all things, is asking uh, OPEC and OPEC Plus to increase oil supply, which uh, was not on their agenda. So it's just amazing, Susan, how all these things kind of just connect. They all connect. We're going back a little bit to prices because, of course, you know, and everything, you know, inflation is very much on the mind of policymakers, but also the market. So let me ask you, historically, high prices has always brought on more energy production, but this time it seems to be lagging. And so I'm wondering, is something different this time? Well, I think what's happened is the shale producers in the United States, the public companies, there's a second shale revolution, which is their relationship with investors. They had to rebuild the relationship with investors. They had to get, give money back to investors rather than spending all their cash flow or their cash flow plus on growth. So they're being much more cautious. I think the, the, the mantra you hear resounding across the shale oil fields is capital discipline. Now that's not true for the private companies, the ones that are owned by private equity. But they, you know, they're not the bulk. The large part are the public companies. So they're just being more cautious. They'll start to expand when they feel, you know, more confident that prices will stay up. But they can't, they, they have to have a new social contract with investors. And that's what they're working on. So you're not going to get these huge surges. Now, next year, we think we will actually see some substantial growth in the US, but not like this growth that we had seen uh, a few years ago where you had a growth of production from a country that the world had never seen before, nothing like, there'd been nothing on the scale of the shale revolution in terms of the additional volumes that were brought on. Now it's gonna be more moderated. I always look at issues as a consumer because I am a consumer and how is this going to impact consumers? Can consumers expect to pay higher prices for longer or what might be the policy response we see from government? I think that um, you're going to see politicians. I mean, I heard it on Capitol Hill today. Politicians are going to respond to higher prices. They'll probably have, you know, the kind of congressional hearings that they've had in the past where they declaim and, you know, bring energy executives before them and blame, blame them. Uh, they'll never look at their own policies or, or really stop to think that this actually started. This is an energy problem that started in China and of which they have very little control. But I think, you know, we are gonna see um, higher gasoline prices. At this point, I don't think they're gonna shoot through the ceiling or anything unless something happens, but they'll be high enough that it really is a burden on people's pocketbooks, particularly, uh, you know, working people have to commute distances and they'll see higher natural gas prices. Now, we have a huge amount of natural gas in this country, but you can't build the pipelines to supply it, like New England needs more pipeline capacity, but you know the, the politicians who control this would rather import, L you actually use LNG rather than, uh, and uh, take the risk of you know people being forced to switch to oil because there isn't enough natural gas. Pipeline issues certainly are are challenging, have been challenging for the past decade, right? It's it's our pipeline map in America is impressive <laughs> with with how many pipelines we have, but we still didn't have enough for shale, and we still don't necessarily have enough pipelines. But they're they're challenging to build. Yeah, you can build them if you're building them in Texas, Louisiana, but I mean there is this very strong effort to choke off pipelines as the um, as a way to, you know, people who don't want to see a domestic energy industry. But the consequence of that is if you really succeed at choking off domestic production, you just import more oil. And prices continue to soar, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, in fact, shale, the advent of shale has been a great stabilizer and has brought energy security that I, I give the example in the new map in 2019, the most important piece of hardware in the world oil industry this place called Abqaiq in Saudi Arabia, Iranian missiles, supposedly from Yemen, but actually Iranian missiles and drones set out to destroy it. 
If that had happened five years earlier, there would have been panic in the market. The price would have shot up. But lo and behold, the price hardly moved. And the difference is that this incredible security cushion that has come from uh, U.S. Uh, production being where it is. It's, I mean, it would not have been uh, two decades ago. No one would have thought it was possible that the U.S. was going to be the world's largest producer. Right now, the, th- the world's third largest LNG exporter, which is uh, another revolution. Yeah, I mean, you're, you know, you're an expert on this whole LNG development, but you know, the U.S., as you say, is one of the big three of LNG, and LNG is a big global growth business. And by the way, one of the big markets for LNG, U.S. LNG, happens to be China. But I know our, you know, America's allies, the Japanese, the South Koreans, are very glad to see U.S. LNG because they see that as a, a source of of security. It's a becomes a new dimension in the relationship, just like it's a new dimension in our relationship with India. And you, and you mentioned that in the new map. You say, you know, uh, LNG has really now become a tool in the trade box. Uh, and Donald Trump was very keen to use uh, LNG exports for, for Europe and also to reduce the trade deficit with China. Are, are you still hearing that discussion in Washington? No, I think it's, no, well, I think you hear it, but in the congressional side, I mean, I think the administration has been strangely silent about it. I mean, it's very important in our relationship with India, but they don't really talk about it. They just want to talk about, you know, net zero carbon. And I think for the Indians, this is this is very important. And, you know, I, I could see at our conference in India, they were surprised. Not they heard about it from the U.S. companies, but they didn't hear about it from the U.S. government. And it, I'll just say they were surprised. Okay. Well, and it's somewhat surprising to me since actually the it was the Obama Biden administration that approved the first U.S. LNG export terminals. Uh, you're absolutely right, and that gave the go ahead to the birth of this important industry, which has really been a a significant contribution to the U.S. economy. I mean, don't you find the same thing, Susan? That I mean, the same observation. Absolutely, and. Um, you know, when I when I was working on my book on LNG, I had to go back to my editor and say, you know, I have to write a whole book on shale gas because without shale gas, we wouldn't have LNG exports. And I also had to write a chapter on the U.S. as an LNG importer. I mean, in a decade, the U.S. went from being a potentially a, the world's largest LNG importer to now potentially the world's largest LNG exporter. <laughs> yeah, so as you know, in the, in the book, I have this description that in 2003, there were, I remember I was at this conference center, a hotel in Denver at the Denver airport to, on this big study that the US had to get ready to be a really big, the world's biggest, as you say, importer of LNG. And lo and behold, at that same time, you know, several hundred miles away, they were proving the concept of shale gas and which would completely change the outlook. And it was in, and in a f- short time. So things don't stay the same. No. And, and uh, you know, I suppose, though, you know, you don't, I, I think people didn't appreciate the technology involved in, in shale gas and whether or not it would really take off. And I suppose maybe that's a bit maybe where we are with these ambitious net zero goals. I guess there's a hope that technology will save the day. But as you said, it's just not clear what that technology is. Yeah. And in terms of being gung-ho, you know, you do have to say, well, what's the downside? What happens if things don't get there? And what happens if we're seen in, you know, the autumn of 2021 in terms of an energy crisis, we're going to have recurrent ones because the policies and investment aren't there. You know, it's pretty interesting that here's the Biden administration that wants to move aggressively on climate. And there it is asking OPEC for more oil. You know, you got to do a little computation in your head to understand that. And, you know, related to that, you've mentioned financing. Um, you know, what I hear from a lot of bankers is they're reluctant to finance anything due to ESG concerns. Yeah, I mean, ESG has become more and more strong, you know, and the pressures on the financial institutions, you know, to talk to, you know, with one bank recently, And they feel on the one hand, they have a big obligation, a big business to emerging market countries that want investment in oil and gas and so forth. And then, but the pressures that they have from regulators in the West not to finance that. And I think we're just really at the beginning of that, Susan. 
because we're going to see regulations coming. I mean, look at people now saying the Federal Reserve should become a climate regulator. The SEC should be a, a climate regulator. I mean, is that their responsibility or should that be other agencies? You know, when they set up the Federal Reserve, it wasn't to regulate climate. So there will be consequences of this. And if the consequences are recurrent periods of shortage or disruption, there will be potentially a political reaction against it, you know, which will actually impede achieving the goals that the people want to achieve. Exactly. And I think, as you said, we're, I'm not even sure we've seen it yet. We had, you know, soaring prices, but what strikes me is we're, we're not actually even in winter yet. <laughs> right. So I, I, I'm sensing uh, maybe another round of soaring energy prices might, may change the discussion. Although maybe this time is different. And one uh, energy minister, I was at the uh, gas tech event in Dubai a month ago, and, and one, you know, Middle Eastern energy minister, and, you know, I know you, you work a lot with them, and so they can be very direct. He said, essentially, uh, consumers are going to have to pay more for energy or governments are going to have to subsidize energy prices. And I'm, I'm curious what you think of that. Well, I think that's what's absolutely actually right now in Europe, that the governments are, are scrambling to throw billions of dollars to subsidies to consumers so that they won't notice the high prices. They're very worried about a recurrence of the yellow vests, which were the protesters in France. Uh, there was a very interesting column by uh, Joe Sternberg in the Wall Street Journal recently, in which he pointed out that British Prime Minister Boris Johnson actually kind of laid out what it's going to cost consumers to pursue their policy and said, that's unusual for a politician to do that. But if you we do move into a realm of higher prices, there will be, I think, political reactions to it, which have not really been taken into account. Now you get around it with subsidies of one kind or another, or you do it through regulation so people don't see it. But then if you get sharp changes, you know, you look at the history, and if I think about what I've written in the new map and going back to the quest and the prize, you do get a political response. Sometimes, of course, the political responses are short-sighted. And um, I remember once talking to Congressman uh, Oxley, who wrote Sarbanes-Oxley, which is one of the big pieces of financial regulation after one of the financial crises. And he said the lesson of it is, you know, don't write legislation in the middle of crises because you get legislation doesn't work very well, but that may be the response to it. So I think we're, um, you know, I describe, you know, the new map as new terrain, and I think we're on a new terrain, and um, people may not see very clearly where we're headed, but it is different, and there will be a lot of different forces at work. And in the um, last chapter, I talked about disruptions, and I'm thinking we have two disruptions going on right now. And then we have the overall geopolitical questions about U.S.-China relations and the uncertainty of, of them. So, you know, I would say at a time like this, uh, prudence is a, is a good approach to things. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets by ABAX. For episode transcripts and additional episode information, including research, editorial, and video content, please visit smartermarkets.media. Smarter Markets is 100% listener-driven, so please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or producer. Smarter Markets, its hosts, guests, employees and producer, Abax Technologies, shall not be held liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on informational viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets. Thank you for listening, and please join us again next week. Thank you.